The title of this panel is Creative Space and Mixed Media, Augmented Reality, Social Media and Interdisciplinary Aesthetics. Our first speaker will be J. David Bolter, and in case you're wondering where he is, um, well, he's not here, he's on the other side of the world. Um, so he will be uh, appearing before us on this screen and uh, giving his presentation via video. For those of you who don't, do not know him, uh, J. David Bolter is Director of the Wesley New Media Centre and Wesley Chair of New Media at Georgia University Institute of Technology. He is the author of Turing's Man, Western Culture in the Computer Age, Writing Space, the Computer, Hypertext and the History of Writing, Remediation with Richard Brewson, and Windows and Mirrors with Diana, Diana Gromala. In addition to writing about new media, Walter collaborates in the construction of new digital media forms. With Michael Joyce, he created StorySpace, one of the early hypertext authoring systems. Now, with the AEL collaborators of Georgia Tech, Walter helps to create applications for entertainment, educational, and cultural heritage. The platform for these applications is the AEL's Argon browser for smartphones and tablets. And I assume that Jay will be talking about some of these uh, developments during his presentation. So, again, without further ado, Talon, are you going to hit that big play button again? All right, sit back and enjoy J. David Bolter. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about a particular platform for augmented reality and its uses for social media and cultural heritage. The platform is called Argon and it was developed by my colleagues at the Augmented Environments Lab at, uh, here at Georgia Tech. Now augmented reality is a technology that has been around for at least 20 years depending upon your definition of the term. For the first 10 or 15 years of its life, augmented reality existed as a laboratory technology, by and large, simply because the uh, tracking and graphics that were required for augmented technology uh, required expensive equipment that could, in general, only be uh, installed and used in selected laboratories uh, in computer science departments. And for that same period of time, augmented reality was generally thought of as a technology for uh, utilitarian uses, for tasks where workers would need information while they were making particular repairs or adjustments to uh, technical equipment, for perhaps medical uh, interventions and applications, for a variety of, in other words, serious applications. More recently, with the advent of smartphones and other portable technologies, we're able to have a kind of augmented reality that becomes a true media form within our culture, available to hundreds of thousands or even millions of users. And that has expanded vastly the range of possible applications, particularly applications that interest us, as I understand it, on this panel today, in uh, terms of social media, artistic expression, popular entertainment forms, cultural heritage. The Argon browser was developed for the iPhone in precisely that spirit, to be available to a large body of users who are not technical, technically trained in programming or the technologies that were required for augmented reality, and who could therefore put the technology to use for their own purposes uh, in creative ways. I'd like to let my colleague Blair McIntyre, the uh, director of the Augmented Environments Lab, speak for a minute about the philosophy and uh, use of this uh, particular browser. Argon is an augmented reality web browser for the iPhone. When we created Argon, we wanted to create a platform that allows people to create, distribute, and experience mobile augmented reality using the same skills, tools, and technologies they use right now to create and deliver websites. So if we think about what the web has enabled, where Anybody who has a little bit of information can put it out there, and if you, it's interesting to you, you can get it. So your neighborhood grocery store, your Barnes and Nobles could have a coupon or local specials, and they're available to you on the web, and we use this all the time. There's nothing like that for mobile augmented reality right now. The only kinds of apps that are out there 
are things where people have had the time, effort, and funds to create a significant application. What we want to do is allow the local grocery store owner to put up their specials. So when you look around their store, you can see the specials located around you rather than on the screen in 2D. Or if you think about um, fans of TV shows like Sex and the City. If you go to New York, you can take a Sex and the City tour of New York. You can find websites where people map out where all the episodes took place. Those fans who've created those websites could simply add a few scripts, make their website Argon enabled, and now you could go and take a walking augmented reality tour of New York based on your favorite TV show. What we're doing with Argon is letting people create their own interfaces, their own mashups of this information in much the same way that they create websites and deliver it to people. So I could go outside and look around and see what you want me to see, the Flickr images you care about, and have the additional interactions and behaviors that, that you wanted to convey to me, not what some app developer specifically wanted to do. So as you can see by the rubric here, Communications and Marketing at Georgia Tech, the tenor of that discussion was aimed at uh, uses of Argon for social media that are themselves quite uh, general, quite uh, potentially even commercial. But what's exciting to many of us at, uh, in, in, in my research group about the Argon browser is that those same characteristics that make it potentially in interesting to advertisers um, or for uh, commercial social media applications also make Argon interesting for artistic expression and for cultural heritage. Namely, the ability of um, designers and uh, producers to use this technology, technological platform without having to go to the technologists, to the programmers, uh, for, uh, for f to, to actually create their vision. So um, it, the purpose of Argon as a, general perp as a general tool for uh, augmented reality is precisely that it will be available to uh, uses that hadn't even been anticipated by the developers. I want to talk about those uses in the context of cultural heritage and speculate a little bit about the uses for uh, artistic expression. But before I do that, I'd like to uh, discuss in some detail some of the uh, technical um, characteristics of the Argon platform, which I think are particularly uh, appropriate or interesting in the context of cultural expression. So Argon itself is uh, based like uh, is an augmented reality browser, which means that it's uh, one of those class of applications like Layer or Wikitude that works uh, on the model of a web browser. You put up information uh, that you want to serve to your audience on a server on the on the internet, and then the user with who has an individual mobile phone accesses those the channels of information just as they would access web pages, as Blair explained. In this case, Argon is based on the language, the markup language that is used by Google for Google Earth, namely KML. And because it's based on this markup language, it is, uh, there are tutorials, there's a body of knowledge and expertise about how to use KML that can be immediately transferred to people who want to do things in Argon, again, like designers of cultural heritage sites or artists. Um, I want to talk about three key features of Argon uh, that, as I say, make it interesting for a wide variety of um, social media and uh, artistic applications. And those are the following, what are called placemarks, geospots, and panoramas. The placemark is a feature of Argon that is directly borrowed from KML. I, that is to say, that's available in Google Maps and Google Earth. With a place mark, you're simply indicating a place in the world, a location at which information is stored. And in the case of Google Maps or Google Earth, you would access that information on a computer screen or on your mobile phone uh, by looking at a map, a representation of that location. But of course, the whole point of augmented reality is that uh, location-based information is appears to you in the world. So in the Argon browser, place marks are um, visibly present for you, in front of you, uh, as you look through your phone 
uh, at the uh, at the video on the phone through the phone in, into the world around you, you see these place marks. And what these place marks may have associated with them are text, uh, images, and video. The second uh, uh, characteristic of argon that's important for um, our uses is the um, geospot. And the, a geospot is a special kind of place mark that is meant to solve the difficult problem of um, registration or location awareness uh, on the part of an AR application. Uh, most of AR augmented reality applications that run on mobile phones use the GPS system, global positioning system, in order to figure out where the user is in order to know where to place the information. The problem with GPS is that it is not very precise. That means that uh, for certain kinds of information, uh, there's no problem. But if you want to have precise registration where you know exactly where in the visual field of the user the information is going to be placed, then you do have difficulty because uh, GPS can't provide that kind of um, accuracy. So a geospot is a way of cheating in a certain sense. What we do is we say to the user, stand here. If we know where the user is standing exactly, then we know where we can put the information in his or her visual field so that it will appear in place, it will appear in the right place. Um, and this works remarkably well if you just uh, can give the user an indication of where to stand by showing them an image, or in this case by showing them on the map where their position is located, then you can use uh, this uh, Geospot uh, feature, which is an additional feature added to the KML language by Argon for the purpose of locating the information in space. Now, the most I think the most uh, interesting, perhaps unusual feature of Argon is what we call panoramas, and that needs a little bit of explanation. Uh, the key to most augmented reality applications, whether they're commercial or cultural heritage, is that the user looks through uh, the, f the phone or the, or the tablet, uh, the mobile device of whatever sort, um, sees a video image of the world around him or her with the computer information, computer added graphics or, or text uh, set into, composited onto that video. Um, and Argon actually works that way too. That's ordinarily the way you would see things through the um, iPhone uh, interface. However, um, early on in the development of Argon, the programmers had the idea of, you, of creating what they called a panorama for the purposes of developing or debugging a particular application. The idea was this. Um, suppose you wanted to have a, uh, an application that was about a particular battlefield, let's say, Gettysburg uh, in the United States. And um, obviously, you want to develop this application. You want to have uh, perhaps imagery of the of reenactors, Civil War reenactors. You may want to have textual or graphic information or images uh, set into the location of Gettysburg. Um, you don't want to have to go to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, every time you want to test a new version of the experience. So what the uh, a panorama allows you to do is to take a panoramic image of a particular location and then to um, put that image into a special format which is read into the Argon browser and appears as the background video uh, of, the, uh, of the browser uh, experience. That means that you can be in a laboratory, you can be in your, at your desk, wherever you are developing this, this application and uh, when you hold up the, uh, the phone, you will, it will look as if you are uh, on the battlefield. You'll see around you the battlefield, and then any information and graphics that you put in front of the battlefield will appear as they would in the real location. The idea, as I said, was for debugging so that when you finished and got the experience the way you wanted it, you take away the panorama, and you would be able to, um, again, see the battlefield, you know, that the users could take it out into the actual location. So that was the idea, the reason why the panorama was developed. But it soon became clear that panoramas have a lot of potential um, applications as experiences in their own right. Whenever you want to contrast uh, for the user, for the uh, viewer, 
the difference between where he or she is at this moment and some other reality, some other moment, some other environment. You can use the panorama to represent that other. The most obvious application of this for cultural heritage is that you can show the user what a place looked like in the past. So you can, uh, you know, if you go to the Parthenon today and what you see now is the temple in ruins, you could show the user a reconstructed version of the Parthenon a on the, uh, in, in a panorama set, as it would appear, set into the hill itself. And then the user can hold up the a tablet or the iPhone, look at the uh, panorama and compare it to what they see in front of them physically. Um, there's also possibilities for creating um, scenes or elements that never existed. Perhaps you want to stage a narrative experience in which the user uh, appears to be, uh, appears to see um, characters who are interacting in various ways, uh, perhaps in the past, in that location. You could use the panorama for that purpose, and again, what would be interesting would be the contrast between what they see in front of them now in the world and what the, um, what the browser is showing them as happening in the past or in another, in an alternate reality. So panoramas turn out to have a lot of potential, and of course they have an important historical dimension as well. Uh, historically, the notion of panorama uh, as a cultural uh, and, and um, artistic artifact goes back uh, to the end of the 18th and into the 19th century when actual panoramic uh, exhibits were set up in Europe and in eventually in North America too, so that visitors would go into a rotunda, a uh, round building with a panoramic painting in it and experience a kind of virtual reality. These uh, virtual reality panoramic buildings led to a whole set of media forms that included miniature panoramas and panoramic uh, postcards or books that users could, uh, that viewers could take away with them. There's a whole history of the panoramic tradition in uh, European and, and, and uh, American um, uh, cultural history that we can appeal to when we think about how augmented reality panoramas are both similar and different uh, in terms of presenting cultural heritage. So there's some interesting historical dimensions to this. But as I say, what's interesting about um, Argonne's ability to show panoramas are precisely that we can create the experience for the user in, a, in location in a way that they haven't seen before. I'm going to um, show you now a panorama uh, as it would appear in the uh, my iPad um, uh, uh, to give you an idea of, of what we're talking about here, this ability to create a kind of 360 um, virtual world. This is an example of a panorama loaded into the Argon browser. What you're looking at is a shot uh, from the, a rooftop of Centennial Olympic Park in Atlanta, a panoramic image that was made using um, a special panoramic camera, but uh, in fact you can make panoramas using uh, an iPhone or really any digital camera and a stitching program. And then as you can see, um, the image is uh, a 360 image, an entire space that in which you appear to be immersed in the city of Atlanta. And when I move the iPad or the iPhone, the orientation sensors in the device allow the image to adjust so that you get a, a sense of the space that is surrounding you in the panorama. Once again, the exciting thing about panoramic, this panoramic uh, experience is that it enables me to uh, contrast where the user is, in fact, to where you know you might want them to be, or some other place or other time. So those three features, place marks, geospots, and panoramas, which are all quite simple, and as I've said, based on uh, te te technological features that were already existing in either in uh, KML, in uh, uh, developed by Google, or in a much longer tradition of uh, panoramic entertainment. Those features can lead to a wide variety of 
uh, applications in cultural heritage. So I'd like to close by uh, giving you an, one example of the kind of um, application that we are uh, working with or working on. This project, which is called the um, Lights of Saint-Étienne, is a um, augmented reality tour or experience that's meant to take place in the uh, cathedral in Metz, France. It's being developed by Maria Engberry and uh, along with myself and a team of students at uh, Georgia Tech in Atlanta. And you may ask, why Metz, France, if we're in Atlanta? Um, in fact, Georgia Tech has a campus in France, uh, uh, in the city of Metz, and we began the project last spring when we were actually in residence there. So uh, the Metz Cathedral is, is a very significant and interesting Gothic cathedral, uh, noted for, among other things, its stained glass. It has uh, an elaborate uh, and well-preserved collection of stained glass that dates from the Middle Ages all the way to the 20th century. So that's one of the things that we wanted to feature in this uh, augmented reality experience. We wanted to actually use the uh, AR experience of uh, Saint-Étienne to uh, experiment with different techniques for enhancing a visit to the cathedral using augmented reality and also making a definition of augmented reality as broad as possible. So we have five or six different stations within the cathedral where the user can stand and at each of those stations they experience a somewhat different kind of augmentation of their uh, visit. Um, for example, in some cases they may hear music that uh, constitutes a kind of ambiance for the space. Um, in other locations they will hear a narrative that describe uh, what they're seeing or looking at uh, in, in the cathedral or the historical significance. And um, in particular, I mentioned the stained glass windows. One of the um, stations allows them to get a close-up look at the stained glass. So if they hold the phone up, or if they actually just look up at the stained glass, they'll see the windows, but the windows are far away, right? They're up high, and it's hard to get a good view of them. Um, but they'll also be able to tap the phone and bring into close-up uh, one or more of the uh, figural windows so that they can see in more detail what it is that makes the stained glass uh, in the Metz Cathedral so special, at the same time to, as they hear a narrative regarding the, um, the windows. I want to mention one other station and one other uh, aspect of this experience that exploits the notion of panoramas. The Metz Cathedral is unusual in that it actually began as two separate churches. There was an older building that was the cathedral itself, and then there was a chapter house or a church uh, for the canons of the um, of Saint of uh, Metz that was actually shared a wall with the cathedral. Uh, in the late Middle Ages and the early uh, Renaissance, the decision was made to knock down that wall and to expand the cathedral to take up the other church. That's resulted in a rather unusual architectural plan for the cathedral. And it's something that certainly you would want to bring to the attention of viewers, uh, visitors to Saint-Étienne. It occurred to us that we could use the Argonne browser's ability to create panoramas to give the visitor a better sense of the architectural evolution of the cathedral in the following way. So if you stand in the cathedral today, of course, what you see is the modern space that consists of the two churches joined. And if you look closely, you'll notice that the columns at the east end of the cathedral are in fact different from the columns along the rest of the nave because they are the columns from the original um, second church. But uh, beyond that, it's a little bit hard to get a sense of where the one church ended and the other began. So uh, one of the things that we're doing in this project is we're going to create a panorama using uh, 3D models um, that will allow the uh, visitor to uh, experience the changes in time uh, as the cathedral evolved. The visitor stands in the part of the cathedral that was the other church, the older, smaller church, and they'll have a 
a set of buttons that allow them to choose various time, various dates in the history of the cathedral. And if they choose the earliest date, what they'll see in front of them is a wall, the wall representing the way the churches were configured in the um, early, in the 13th century. And then as they move forward, they will see the wall, they can see the wall disappear. The wall actually, of course, is, is drawn in three, as a 3D model. The 3D model disappears and eventually they see the church as it existed uh, from the 15th century on. This is an example then of what I was suggesting that one could use panoramas for to take you back into the past and show you how things looked at a different moment, always allowing you the opportunity to simply lower the screen and see the, you know, the current space, the current time uh, as well. And so the, the um, augmentation here is between what the phone or the tablet is presenting to you and the space as you see it today. So the cathedral uh, project, the Lights of saint Etienne, is just one example of the cultural heritage possibilities that we see for Argonne. But we also have a student uh, working in uh, the Augmented Environments Lab on a variety of cultural heritage and artistic projects that use Argonne in different ways. The common feature in all cases is to try to exploit the um, special uh, affordances of the Argonne browser to uh, enhance the user's experience of a cultural or uh, heritage site or to give them an artistic experience that they could not have um, in other forms. Thank you.